You're dumb. You're dumb. Same thing. Still dumb. Good evening, everybody. Over the last couple of weeks or so, I have been having a bit of a debate of sorts with a YouTube user called Chad Elliott, who goes by the name of 530, who likes to call himself the AK, which is short for the Atheist Killer. That's killer with an A and not an E-R. Now, Mr. Elliot has proposed a logical argument that he claims is undefeated, and he pimps this argument on his channel as a killer argument against atheism. That's killer with an E-R and not an A. Although, admittedly, he missed that little trick and instead called it the Elliot argument. Now, the Elliot argument appears to be the bastard offspring resulting from a drug fueled drunken one-night stand between William Lane Craig's God-did-it argument and the Kalam cosmological argument, and it goes something like this. If you reject the notion of an uncreated creator, which he defines as an internal entity that caused and created the universe, and he states is perfectly logical, then you must either accept that space and time are eternal, or that something came into existence out of pure nothing and created the entire universe, and that these are the only two alternatives, and that they are both entirely illogical and irrational, and because all atheists reject the idea of an uncreated creator, which is apparently logical, all atheists must, therefore, be illogical and irrational. He states this argument using all sorts of acronyms, which confuse the hell out of you, and are supposed to have broad meanings, which he takes two whole videos to explain. But once you've translated them, what I've just said is essentially what he's saying. Now, this argument is, of course, not a horseshit, but I was intrigued to find out just how many ways I could defeat it, especially as Chad is so insistent that it is utterly undefeatable, apparently. Well, for starters, we could look at the basic logic. We don't need to actually examine what he's arguing, just the way that it is argued. And this is what we find. Our friend, Mr. Killer, is basically giving us a truth statement, along the lines of, if something is not true, then it must be false. And what he states is that, if something is not logical, then it must be illogical. Which is impeccable logic, if I have to say so myself. However, where Mr. Killer's argument takes the gun it's holding, puts the end of the barrel in its mouth and squeezes the trigger, decorating the wall behind and the ceiling above with pastel shades of brain, is when he offers two alternative illogical possibilities, and states that it is not possible to have a third illogical possibility. And with that, the Elliot argument is defeated. Right there, with a level of defeat that usually only comes about when magic rings are dropped into volcanoes. Now, the more astute among you may have spotted where he is going wrong. And why? But don't worry if you haven't, because it isn't immediately obvious. Mr. Killer has stated that if his logical and rational assertion is not accepted, then there are only two other possible outcomes, and both of these are illogical, and that it is not possible to have a third illogical outcome. But in reality, that isn't the case. For any given question, there is an infinite number of illogical and irrational answers that can be given, and because they are illogical and irrational, they do not have to follow logic and fall into either of two proposed categories. It is entirely possible to propose as a third illogical and irrational possibility that in the beginning there was the word, and that the word was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And just leave it at that. And because the answer is an utterly irrational and illogical answer to the question it is supposed to be an answer for, and because it does not conform to either of the categories that he says it should, the Elliot argument is utterly defeated. The correct logical argument he should have used is that if you accept an assertion, and it is not the illogical assertion being put forward in the argument that is accepted, then some other assertion must be accepted, and this assertion must be either logical or illogical, and there are no other possibilities. 
What Mr. Keller is trying to do is to limit and categorize illogical answers to his question using logic. But as the illogical answers are, well, illogical, his job is impossible. I mean, spend any time at all looking through some of the videos posted onto YouTube and it will become apparent that just when you thought that someone couldn't be any more illogical and irrational, someone will say something so bloody stupid that you will be left in no doubt that the depths of illogical and irrational stupidity are indeed bottomless. With Mr. Killer himself, of course, being a very good example of this. Now, if the Elliot argument wasn't easy enough to obliterate with just its logical structure alone, it becomes even easier when you actually address the argument itself. Mr. Killer says that atheists that reject the notion of an uncaused or uncreated creator must either think that the universe is eternal, or that something must come into existence and create it, and nothing else. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm an atheist, and straight away I can think of at least one possibility that is neither of these two, and I'm quite sure that you, as the viewer, can also think of one as well. So, I left a comment on his video telling him where he had gone wrong. Now, Chad Elliott likes to project himself as being a big man in his videos, fearless and in your face, but it turns out that comments on his videos are set to approval only. Presumably so that he doesn't get his arse handed to him in public. You see, when it comes to debating, the AK, the atheist killer with an A, who tries to come over as a player and a gangster, which also end with A, likes to do his defeating in private, of a personal message, and he likes to write in capitals and call you names, but most of all, if you don't answer the questions that he sends you in exactly the way he wants, with exactly the answers he wants, he just resends the same questions again and again and again. I'm going to presume that if there is any claim that the Elliot argument is undefeated, it is because anyone intending to defeat it gives up after a while after they receive the same set of illogical and unanswerable questions for the twelfth time. Let me summarize what happened in my case. Looking very carefully at all the options available, and guessing that this was indeed a first cause argument, I propose that the universe came into being all by itself, without a cause or a creator. If one of the options was that a creator could come into existence out of absolutely nothing in order to create the universe, then there is absolutely nothing preventing the universe from coming into existence out of the same nothing all by itself. Only it does not appear that Mr. Killer accounted for that possibility, so I knew that I had a sure-fire winner, and that the Elliot argument was going to be defeated again. Well, because I was making a positive claim that I had a third alternative that he hadn't thought of, he insisted that I had to answer questions about it. But nothing could have prepared me for how stupid his questions were going to be. He started off by asking me if my proposal involved a personal mind, if it was uncreated and where it existed, and for some reason he kept referring to my proposal as a cause, even though I had proposed that there was no cause, and he just kept asking me the same questions again and again and again, saying that I had to tell him what caused the creation of the universe, even though I clearly said that no cause or creator was involved. Now, at this point I must point out that it is of course irrelevant if my proposed answer is factually correct. It doesn't even have to be logical, because after all it just has to be a third possible alternative that is neither of the two illogical choices that he has presented in his argument. After a while, he accepted that the answers to his questions were contained in my proposal, after I simply copied and pasted it as the answer to every single question he asked. This should have been enough to cause his argument to hoist the white flag, and send a messenger to inform me that it wanted to discuss terms of surrender. But he wasn't giving up that easily. Oh no. That's right, he sent me more questions. Among these questions was one that asked if, in my proposal, any part of the universe was eternal. Now, I have the ability to read a question like that and understand it in a dozen different ways, even if the person asking the question doesn't realize that the question can have a dozen different meanings. Something occurred to me, and I went and looked at his argument again, 
and I asked him to clarify what he meant by eternal. Pointing out that, given the question, it was entirely possible to answer that a part of the universe was indeed eternal, and that that part was a 1990s all-girl R&B band from Britain, and so he clarified that he meant eternal to mean without a beginning or an end. Personally, if I was him, I would have just said that it meant timeless, but if he wanted to use that definition, then it was fine by me, because it allowed me to defeat his argument yet again inflicting the kind of undignified defeat that is usually only suffered when your technologically advanced mechanised infantry is thoroughly routed by Stone Age teddy bears throwing rocks. You see, it follows that if something is considered illogical simply because it is eternal, then you cannot have something else that that particular something is being compared to that is also eternal, but which is considered to be logical. Certainly not in the same logical argument. Because the cr uncreated creator in Mr. Killer's argument existed long enough to actually create something, Mr. Killer is implying that the uncreated creator existed in some concept of space and time. And because the uncreated creator is eternal, this concept of space and time that the uncreated creator exists in must also be eternal. Which kind of implies that Mr. Killer is saying that some concept of space and time is eternal, which by his own reasoning is illogical. So it doesn't just break the law of non-contradiction set down by Aristotle that states that no one part of a logical argument can contradict another, it grinds it into dust. The other questions he asked me were just as epic. He asked me, among other things, what existed before time and space existed, literally begging me to answer that nothing existed, and he insisted that I explained how it happened, but I wasn't falling into that one, because I knew where it was going with it. Instead, what I had in store for my new friend Chad was inspired and would send his arguments to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean after torpedo in its rudder so it could only go around in circles while I subjected it to sustained naval bombardment. I told him that before anything came into existence, before the first moment passed by, there wasn't nothing in existence, but rather there was a potential for existence. This is actually true when you think about it, because otherwise everything would have to come from nothing, and that isn't what science indicates. Science indicates that there was a singularity, which is where the space-time continuum comes together into a single point with no dimension. And because time is meant to measure change, if all things are contained in a single point and are unchanging, then the singularity is also timeless. The singularity is in essence the potential for existence, but it does not exist anywhere and at any time. Now, because there was no predetermined notion of what would exist, that potential for existence had to include the potential for all possible things to exist, or in fact not exist. So in effect, you could say that the potential was infinite, and if something like a universe was possible, it could exist, and because it could exist, it had to exist or not exist, and as the universe didn't already exist, the universe came into being, and this of course is where the fun started. He asked why only certain potential possibilities came into being, and I pointed him in the direction of the concept of multiple parallel universes, which is a serious and logically valid scientific concept that contends that there are an infinite number of alternate parallel universes, each separated from and different to their neighbours by just a single quantum event. So in effect, all possibilities can be realised into existence, including those possibilities that lead there to be no universe at all. He really didn't like the idea of multiple alternate parallel universes and told me not to mention it again. By that point, the Elliot argument had already been shot in the head, torpedoed, shelled, bombed and sunk, so I didn't really need to point out that I had just sliced it into an infinite number of quantum side slices as well. But the question still continued, and he still continued to ask me where something that does not exist can exist, and what caused something without a cause, and I just sent him the same answers. 
answers that explain that a potential existence is not actually an existence. So it doesn't need to exist anywhere. But at the same time, it is not entirely nothing either. Because nothing is the absence of something, and there isn't anything that could be absent. But because the potential is infinite, and nothing is a possibility, the potential has to include the potential for nothing as well. I did tell you it was inspired. The possibilities are endless, because my argument has got one thing that his hasn't, and that's infinite potential. Anyway, he then added another question to the growing list of questions he was spamming me with, which summed up exactly how poorly he understood his own argument, let alone the one I was putting forward, and apparently it was a serious question. He asked me how the infinite potential that the universe derived itself from, without a cause and without a creator, decided when it was time, in a timeless non-existence, to create the universe, in a proposed situation where no cause or creator were involved. He clarifies this by adding that the universe is 4.5 billion years old, so why isn't it 20.5 billion instead? Yes. I know. The stupid. It burns. And in this case, it burns with a brightness that outshines the sun. I must say, that at least asking how fucking magnets work is a legitimate question. Mr. Killer's question is bordering on not even being wrong, and betrays a very childlike understanding of the subject matter at hand. And I think it is probably as far as I'm going to get with him. He insists that before he answers any questions that I pose, I answer all of his questions first. But no matter what answers I give him, he insists that they are wrong. Either because he just doesn't understand the answer, or the answer doesn't seem to fit in with his picture of reality. Or destroys his argument, so he just sends the same set of questions again and again and again usually telling me that I have somehow failed. But, anyway, it's been several days now since he sent me anything new, and I keep copying and pasting the last set of answers to the last set of questions he sent me whenever he resends them, seeing as the answers are just going to be the same. After a while, he stopped replying, so I'm guessing he's given up. So much for undefeated. I consider that the Elliot argument is well and truly beaten, and in this video I have presented the reason why. Mr. Chad Elliot does not seem to be able to categorise my proposed explanation into any of his categories, and he does not seem to be willing or to be able to explain his own argument, and why it is not an illogical pile of horseshit with the defensive capabilities of an angry lettuce. Feel free to pop by his channel and tell him that his argument is easier to defeat than the American Samoan football team. But most of all, tell him that nobody is buying his excuse that his keyboard is stuck when he types all in capitals. And Chad, if you are watching this, typing only in capitals is not just the internet equivalent of shouting, in which case you're giving everyone a clear indication that you are an obnoxious cock. If you do it all the time, it's a really good indication that you are also a fucking moron, who in the real world never got past writing in block capitals with crayons. Seriously, Chad, put the computer back in its box and go back to playing with your speak and spell. That likes it when you only give one word answers too, so you two should feel right at home. Yeah, hey.